All right, hi everyone. Um, like Ali said, I've been the Science and News co-director for the past two years, and we're starting a tradition, I guess, of the outgoing co-director giving the first lecture of the spring series. So uh, I'm excited to talk to you guys today. So aside from Science and the News, I spend my time as a PhD student. I'm a fifth year student in auditory neuroscience, and I study how the brain understands sound. Um, and tonight, I'm gonna be talking not just about sound, but about uh, perception more generally, and how how your brain is actively constructing your perception of the world. So if you spent any time on the internet in early 2015, you have definitely seen this photo. Um, and this photo of a dress in a department store uh, basically broke the internet because it made us question whether we could trust what our eyes were telling us. So I'm gonna play the game. Who sees this dress as being blue and black? All right, white and gold. All right, okay, it's a little more unequal than usual. Usual, it's almost half and half. Um, but yeah, why is there so much disagreement? I would say most, if not all of us here, have normal color vision. We're all looking at the same photo, the same light is bouncing off of that and going into our eyes and activating our, our retinal cells. Um, but we're seeing different colors. And so the explanation is it's complicated, but it involves how our brain interprets the information that's being sent to it from the eyes. Because color, like many of our perceptions of the world, is actually determined entirely by the brain. Um, and more recently, there was a, another, vision, another illusion that went uh, viral, but this time it was an auditory illusion. So these obviously are not limited just to vision. And I'm going to go ahead and play this sound, which is a recording of a single word. I'm sure you can all guess. Um, yeah. 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 So who hears the word laurel? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Who hears the word yanny? Yeah. Yeah. All right, cool, so it still works. Um, so yeah, this, again, the fact that we can sit here in this room and have the same sort of sensory sound that's going through the airs and air and hitting our eardrums, but in, that we can interpret it so differently, it's kind of a, a jarring thing to experience. And of course, the internet got all up in arms about this. There was hashtag Team Laurel, hashtag Team Yanny, um, and it kind of blew up for a couple days. Um, and uh, there was a lot of media attention, and actually I even got my brief moment in the limelight when my explainer tweet went semi-viral, but not really. Um, and I got interviewed by MIT, and a few websites, two radio shows, including one in New Zealand, and a podcast, um, which is really exciting for a scientist who studies sound perception. That, that isn't usually a, a hot media uh, subject. Um, but yeah, why do illusions like this take the internet by storm? Why do we love them so much? Um, and why do they happen in the first place? So my personal opinion um, is that we, we love them because we usually assume that we can trust our senses and that they're an accurate representation of what's out there in the world. Um, but, and therefore, you know, we're all gonna be experiencing the same thing if all of our senses are veridical. Um, but illusions like the dress or the Yanny Laurel thing um, shows that this isn't true. And that's just kind of a, an eerie and, and bizarre experience that we don't get very often. Um, so these illusions work uh, for lots of different kind of detailed reasons, but the kind of main big explanation is that, um, that our perceptual system doesn't involve just taking in light and, and sound waves. Um, the brain actually has to do work to, to interpret the raw signals that it receives from your senses. Um, so for this reason, uh, illusions are kind of like glitches in the matrix, and we can understand how they work, and that can reveal about how our perceptual system is interpreting the sensory information. So that's what I'm going to talk about today. Um, and then we'll revisit these viral illusions at the end and see if we can use a little bit of what we've learned to understand more about how they work. All right, so three parts. Um, and in this first part, I'm going to talk about sensation versus perception, these two kind of seemingly very similar words and how they're different. Um, and then I'll get into how and why and some examples of how perception is deceptively difficult, actually. And then at the end, after the intermission, we'll talk about how or start to talk about many of the ways that how the brain actually solves these problems. All right, 
So what are senses and why do we have them? Um, you might not have thought about this in quite this way, but having a nervous system allows us to observe our environment and then to use the information about our environment to act appropriately. So our senses are our brains, really our brain's only way of getting information about the outside world from its place inside of our skull. Um, and it's important because of course, in order to survive as organisms, we need to know what's out there in the world so that we can do things like find food and approach mates and avoid danger. And so in order to glean as much information as possible about the world, we've evolved different senses that give us information about different kinds of energy out there in the world. And so there's vision, of course. I don't know why it's doing that weird thing with the image there, whatever. Um, so there's vision that takes in light information, um, which is, you know, electromagnetic energy out there in the world. Then there's uh, hearing or audition and touch, which gives us information about vibrations, which is just changes in pressure. So audition can tell us about things that are happening farther away. And then the vibrations travel through the, e through the air and hit our eardrums. And touch can, of course, tell us about pressure that's very close to us, but also things like temperature and pain. Um, so our skin is quite a quite an important sensory system. Um, and then there's taste and uh, smell, which give us information about the chemicals or molecules that are around us. And smell, again, tells us about stuff that's kind of further away and these odorants are traveling through the air. And then taste tells us about things that we have put into our mouths. So within each of these sensory organs, shown here, our eyes, ears, skin, tongue, and nose, um, there are are receptor cells that look kind of like this, um, which are specialized neurons or brain cells. And so they're part of our nervous system. And these cells are responsible for turning the energy of their kind of specific preferred type into an electrical neural signal that's sent up to the brain. Um, and this whole process is called sensory transduction. And there's a lot of really fascinating biology in all of these different processes, the different senses. Um, but if I were to talk about this, we would be here for a really long time. So I'm just going to kind of leave all of that to the biologists and I'll stick to the kind of brain perception bit of it. Um, but the important thing to know is that all sensation occurs by the conversion of information from the outside world or from your kind of internal world, but external to the brain. Um, and that that information is converted into an electrical signal and sent to the brain. That's really annoying. Um, but as I mentioned earlier, in reference to the illusions, uh, there's a big difference between the raw information coming in from your senses and what we experience or feel like we're seeing or hearing. And that's because the eyes and, uh, and uh, ears basically function like a measurement device. They kind of passively measure vibration or light, um, like a camera or a microphone, but they don't interpret that for you. That, that is all the job of the brain. And to try to get a better sense of what I mean by this, um, it can be useful to distinguish between these different processes. So the words that scientists have come up with is uh, that sensation is the process of detecting the physical energy that's in the environment via the activation of those sensory receptor cells that we looked at, um, allowing these various kinds of energy out there in the world to become signals in the brain. And it's largely an automatic and deterministic mechanical process. It's, it's biology. Um, and perception, on the other hand, is the process by which the kind of the nature and meaning of these sensory stimuli are recognized, kind of assigned and interpreted. So kind of selecting which bits of information are important and organizing them and interpreting this information. And we'll go into that in a lot more detail. And so despite how it seems, the kind of perception end of things is actually an active process. So it involves your experience, your expectations, sometimes your motivations. Um, and it's kind of probabilistic. There isn't kind of one solution necessarily to every sort of input that's coming from the senses. And again, we'll go over some examples of that. Um, so I guess for first example, let's say there is coffee out there in the environment. Um, and there's, of course, light that's bouncing off of the coffee cup and maybe the coffee itself and going into your eyes. And there's odorant molecules that are floating through the air and coming into your nose. Maybe you can hear the coffee maker and that's causing vibrations that hit your eardrums. Um, but then identifying that as the smell of coffee um, and then kind of the more complex sort of things that you perceive, like maybe you decide that, oh, it smells like it might be burnt and I actually really don't like coffee. I think I'm going to leave this room. Those are examples of uh, perception. All right. But 
this isn't always such a simple process. Our environments are almost always more complicated than just a single thing there. Um, so let's say you're in some sort of weird situation where you're listening to an audiobook um, while typing an essay and your roommate is playing cello. So, okay, stay with me. Um, so in order to listen to your very important audiobook, your brain needs to be able to uh, take this mixture of sound. And here, there's an audiobook, there's some typing, there's some cello. So all these sounds are kind of out there together. Um, and so in order to pay attention to this audiobook, your brain needs to be able to identify which parts of uh, the sound belong to the voice. So this is what the mixture looks like that's coming in. Um, and, oh gosh, so many sounds. All right, um, and then your brain needs to be able to separate this into the part of that mixture that has summed together in the air that belongs to the voice, and then separate that out from the part of the sound mixture that's the cello and the typing. Um, and as you can see from this uh, input sound wave here, uh, none of that is kind of obvious. There's no nothing about any sort of parts of this that mean typing or something, because really all that's happening is your eardrums are vibrating back and forth with this really complex complicated up and down pattern, and then your brain is able to really easily, um, I mean, you heard that sound and none of you were confused, maybe you were a little bit confused, but you, you could have figured out that that was a voice, some kind of instrument, and some kind of clicky sound. Um, but it's actually a pretty complicated thing to do. All right, so this is what is called an ill-posed problem, um, which just means that there isn't enough information uh, to come to one definite answer, one solution. There's not enough information in the signal that's coming in, so this sound mixture of the, the three different things, um, for your brain to identify those different sound objects. Because, as I said, all that's happening is your eardrums are, are vibrating, and it's, this is kind of like saying uh, x plus y is 18, and then trying to solve for x. There's just not enough information, there's not enough constraints on the problem for you to be able to come to one answer. Um, so to kind of explain this a little bit more, um, let's look at a simpler example and I can show you a visualization um, so you can hopefully see what I mean by ill-posed. So let's say you're listening to a much simpler sound. Um, this uh, two, two tone sequences that kind of cross in the middle like uh, the scene right here. Oh gosh, I thought it was just going to happen once. There we go. Okay. So we can represent that sound in this kind of picture here um, called a spectrogram. And basically each of those little square looking things is one of those tones. And so this is what you're hearing, this kind of interleaved tone pattern. Um, and that's kind of the sound wave that's coming into your brain. But there are multiple ways that you can kind of perceive that. Um, it's possible that you could hear these kind of two tone streams that are crossing. Um, or it's also totally possible that you hear something else, like maybe you hear these two bouncing tone uh, sequences. So let's actually see what you guys hear. So this would be one of the one of the tone sequences if you were to have heard them crossing each other. So again, let's listen to the mixture just once, hopefully. Okay. Oh no. Oh, okay, let's listen to it a bunch. All right, so here is this kind of descending one, and think about whether that is one of the things that you heard there. Maybe, but let's now look at this other option, this kind of bouncing one. So again, I'll try to just... Now here. Does that sound yeah. more like the thing that you heard? Yeah. yeah, so that's that's what most people tend to hear, and there's a, a bunch of different reasons for that. We tend to like sounds that kind of stay in one sort of frequency band, because that's kind of more common. There aren't many sounds out there that kind of span lots of frequencies. But that doesn't mean that this is the right answer. There's, It's equally possible that this thing could be these two crossing um, tone sequences. And of course, this is a really simple example, um, but I hope you can see that, you know, from this mixture coming in, there are actually infinite ways that your brain could solve it. Um, but your brain has some sort of expectations that it can use to try to limit the number of possibilities. And it turns out that actually a lot of perception is 
can be considered an ill-posed problem. Um, because the information that's coming in from our senses is almost always incomplete and noisy or degraded in, in some way. So let's say you're at a, a swanky cocktail party um, and a friend is sharing some juicy gossip about someone arguing with their sister. Um, and we can look at the sound of your friend's speech, again, using this thing called a spectrogram, like we saw before, but this is way more complicated because speech is way more complicated than those tone sequences. And so you have time here on the x-axis, frequency from low, low sounds to high sounds here, and then this up here is matched up with the depiction of sound. So this is just a useful way to kind of look at sound. And the details aren't important, but you can see that there's, while well, it's kind of a lot of stuff going on, there is some structure to it. There's, um, you know, these vertical lines, kind of onset looking things. You can see that there are times when there's white space, so there's no sound happening. There's also these kind of horizontal lines, which again, doesn't, you don't have to understand what those are, but there's clearly some structure here. This isn't just kind of random noise. Um, okay. And you can also see that the speech is changing rapidly over time. However, remember you're at a party, and so your friend probably is not the only one talking. And uh, if we take your friend's speech, where you can see the structure and start adding in more speakers, so here's just with one other speaker, maybe there's three other speakers or seven other speakers, and you can see that as you add more sound, um, all of the structure starts to kind of disappear. It's really hard. If I'd given you this first and asked you to pick out one, one person's speech, it's really hard. It'll kind of all the gaps are all filled in, things are covering each other up. Um, but, and I looked really hard for the recordings of this, couldn't really find it, but you've all been to parties. You, it can be hard, but you're able to usually pick out one person's voice, if, if, unless the background noise is like way too loud. So we're able to solve this. Um, and this is what a uh, sound scientist called the cocktail party problem. It was named in the 1950s, as you can see. Um, and it, that's how you're able to tune in to kind of one sound and ignore all of the other stuff. And it's actually a huge area of research for how, how we do this. Um, and yeah, as we saw earlier, it, there's actually a whole bunch of different ways that you can kind of divide this sound mixture into its component parts. Um, and that's just identifying what sound kind of goes with one sound source, let alone what the person's saying, whether who that person is, whether they're happy or sad. This is just kind of the very beginning part of figuring out what sound belongs to what thing. So you can see that perception involves a lot more than just taking some representation like this or some representation like this and just kind of passing that up to the brain. There's a lot that needs to kind of be done to clean it up. All right, very useful. Okay, so in this first little section, um, I told you about how our senses are our brain's way of getting information about what's out there. Um, that there are these specialized cells that we didn't go into any detail about, but the, that are responsible for taking energy out there in the world and converting it into electrical signals, sending it to the brain. Um, and also tried to get at the difference between sensation and perception. So sensation is kind of the, the bottom-up information that's coming in from the senses, and then it gets passed up to the brain, and perception is kind of assigning meaning and doing a bunch of stuff to that um, signal in order to get uh, an interpretation of that information. All right. So all, oh yeah, and then perception is often an ill-posed problem. So there's, it's complicated, there are many possible solutions, and our brain is what's going to be used to kind of narrow down those possibilities and come to the solution that our brain prefers. All right, so any questions about that first section? Yeah? Uh, when you review these cases of a Johnny or the dress, uh, have, have you been able to, well, well the brain it has a different perception or fill the gaps so you can figure out if it's blue or, mm -hmm. or white or black. But uh, having this try, you say like a 50%, 50% here, but maybe if you have like a kid of so certain age, because they, in the way how they develop the brain, for example, and maybe mm -hmm. they are more, they are more in, do you know, like a... They're more biased. The white more, or, mm -hmm. because I think they grow the three different parts of the brain, or something like that, so, or, or, I just was wondering if there is something that we learn over time. I see. Help us to, to feel those, 
those gaps of your assignment? Yeah, so I don't actually know, I guess the question is about what causes us or why do people see or hear different things? Like, it, could it be something about it's development? Something that, it, that we learn? And at some, at some point, I may mean, have a tendency to say, oh, it used to be 50 percent, but when we put this kind of uh, group of people uh -huh. or age or something, yeah. it's 80, 20 or something. So, for these particular illusions and for a lot of these kind of ones that are found like in the wild that scientists don't make, they just kind of appear out of the internet. Um, they're complicated, so there's not really like one explanation. Um, and people don't really know for these particular ones. I'll talk about some, some of the kind of our best explanations for what's going on at the end, but there are some interesting sort of factors that might kind of bias someone to be more on one side or the other. Um, but we definitely don't know the whole story, and I'm not sure if there are any examples of like younger kids or something seeing or experiencing illusions in a different way. A lot of this stuff, um, even though as as we'll see, it's kind of your brain learning these sorts of strategies and kind of how the world works. Um, but a lot of it seems to be intact pretty early. So um, a lot of like very young kids will experience the same kinds of illusions because they're all pretty pretty basic sorts of things. But yeah, if you still have that question at the end, we can we can talk. Yeah? So, uh, in regards to the examples you showed of the cocktail party, mm -hmm. I wonder if you could tell us if people have been demonstrating the ability to apply like neural networks or machine learning to perform the same kind of filtering function that mm -hmm. the brains are able to do. Yes, there is a lot of that, a lot of neural networks and machine learning that um, is used to do the sorts of things that our perceptual system does. So I'll, I have some examples of that later on in the talk. I don't think any kind of specifically about the cocktail party problem, but there, there are, there are some good networks and actually there's some good demos that I, I didn't have time to fit in here, but I think like Google has like a YouTube video of one where they have a guy talking in a restaurant and you can't hear him at all, but then through deep learning magic that I didn't read the details about, they're able to kind of pull out his voice and you can listen to a recording of it and it sounds, it's not perfect, it sounds definitely like there's some artifacts, but you can understand what he's saying and the background is mostly silent. So there's, there's a lot of kind of work on this um, because it's a big, big problem, especially with things like hearing aids. Like that's a big problem people with hearing aids have is if you're in a restaurant or something, you can't, all the sound is louder. You can't kind of pick out the, the one person sound they're trying to listen to. So if there were kind of these computational ways of zeroing in on one person, that would be really useful. Yeah? Haven't humans evolved to hear certain sounds better than others? Like to hear something that, like if your cousin was talking over the TV or something that you would, uh, like your brain would mm -hmm. to have the TV or something? Yeah, if you know the person's voice, you're probably better able to pay attention to that and ignore other stuff, right? Because yeah, you're like familiar. Like, evolve to, like, have to pick out certain sounds? Yeah. Than others? Yeah, so humans have evolved over lots of time to be able to perceive certain kinds of sounds. So, like, we can't hear sounds that are as high pitched as, like, dogs or mice or other animals can. Um, so, kind of on a big level like that, that's kind of evolution. But when you're talking, you're right about if you know someone's voice, you're able to kind of pay attention to it better than if it's someone you don't know. Um, but that would be more kind of learning during your lifetime, so less evolution, but definitely something that, that people kind of learn without kind of trying to. It's just something that your brain picks up. Let's see, did you have a question? Anyone else? All right, cool. So let's move on to continuing to explore the fact that perception, this thing that we do all the time, um, is actually pretty difficult. Um, and if you're anything like me, um, once you understand some of the kind of computational and complex, 
complex challenges that underlie perception, um, you'll be pretty amazed that we can really do it at all, because um, it's, it's a big problem um, that our brains mostly solve. Um, so one of the ways that we can get kind of a sense for the specific challenges inherent in perception is to try to build an artificial system, like you said, um, to do these sorts of things. Um, and then examining these kind of AI perception systems um, and seeing what they have trouble with and where they fail, that can maybe teach us something about what we are able to do um, with ease. Because it can be hard to look at our own kind of perception and figure out what exactly is going on. Um, so I keep saying that perception is, is like deceptively difficult. Um, and one of my favorite examples of people totally underestimating how, how difficult it is comes from um, MIT back in 1966. So a group of computer scientists had some undergraduates come to MIT to work with them for the summer, and they needed to devise a, a project for these summer undergraduates to do. And so they came up with the Summer Vision Project, which is now like famous in the world of, of computer science, because they aimed in one summer with a couple undergrads to build a computer system that could take in an image, analyze a scene, and identify all of the objects in it. So basically the equivalent of a significant part of the visual system, as they say. Um, and they thought this was like a good size project for a few undergrads to work on for a summer. Um, and while scientists, off, like me especially, I have a hard time predicting how long my research projects are going to take, um, we're usually not this far off because in 1966 they thought this would be solved by the end of the year, um, but of course computer vision is a, a whole huge field. There are thousands of people who have been working on this for decades, um, and we've made a lot of advances, but we haven't like solved it. Um, so yeah, until, until recently, uh, there was no sort of artificial system that could match human performance on a bunch of different visual tasks. And actually, if I had given this talk like five years ago when I started my PhD, I could have pretty comfortably said that there were no sort of um, machine learning algorithms that could do what humans can do. Um, but since then, different uh, kinds of advances in machine learning, including deep learning, um, have exploded and allowed AI to make huge advances in computer vision especially, but also computer audition. Um, so algorithms are now able to take in images and kind of identify objects and segment the image into the different sort of components. They can do this with multiple sort of objects. Um, and there's kind of new stuff coming out all the time about the, the things that these computer systems can do. Um, so while that is you know, very impressive, um, there's still a lot of ways that computer vi vision um, has difficulty with things that we don't even really give a second thought to. Um, so for example, let's take this rather unremarkable picture of Abraham Lincoln. So we can all look at this. We know who he is. We can see the photograph is old, um, that he's wearing a suit. He doesn't look very happy. But we probably also immediately know a bunch of facts about him, that he was the 16th president, that he was assassinated in Ford's theater, kind of all of these sorts of things. Um, but none of that information is obvious from what the retina is sending up to the brain. Because um, the signal that gets sent to your brain consists only of information about how much light is coming from each of those points in space, um, as well as some other information about color, etc. But we're going to simplify the issue by just doing everything in grayscale. Um, so let's think like a retina and represent the brightness of every point in that image as a number. Um, and that ends up looking something like that. So it's not really clear what this is showing. You can maybe, and especially if you're further back, you can maybe see that there's some different sorts of areas areas, like this is kind of sparser, maybe there's like an edge somewhere around here, um, but you can't really tell what it is. Um, and to prove that to you, I'm going to ask you what this is. Anyone have a guess? All right, all right, good guesses. Um, it's actually another picture of Abraham Lincoln. Um, so yeah, we can, as humans, look at these, and even if I hadn't told you this is a photo of Abraham Lincoln or a depiction of Abraham Lincoln, you can tell that like immediately. Um, but yeah, the image that's coming into your retina, like those are totally different things. There's really 
hardly anything that is similar about them. So in order to arrive at this kind of abstract concept of Abraham Lincoln-ness, uh, your brain needs to be able to ignore all of this kind of low-level information from your retina um, that is kind of unimportant and focus on the important information that signals Abraham Lincoln. Um, and this process is really complex. Um, there's a lot of sort of transformations to the data that needs to happen between your retina and, and your object recognition system. Um, and this was a major challenge that people studying computer vision had to overcome to be able to come up with artificial systems that can do object recognition. Um, but to a certain extent, they have succeeded in that. So um, I'm going to show you some, just because it's fun, some photos um, with captions that have been automatically generated by a bot uh, from Microsoft. Um, and you can see that it sometimes does a pretty good job, a car parked in front of a building. So that's, that's good. And this one I think is pretty impressive, a train pulling into a station. So it can tell kind of that there's a station, that train's kind of pulling in, it's not speeding by. So that's pretty impressive. Um, this one, a close-up of a rock, I don't know how good the screen is, but it's missing a very kind of key aspect of this, which is that it's carved to look like a human face. Like, we would all look at this and say, a carving, a sculpture, an ancient relic. Actually, I don't know if you can see that at all, but the computer totally misses out on that and just calls it a rock. Um, and then <laughs> weirder things start happening. So this is a train cake on top of a building. <laughs> and it's unclear exactly what it's picking up on there that looks like a train cake. Um, and then sometimes it's just totally wrong. So this is, this is a protein structure. Is that right? Yes. Yeah. This is a protein structure. Um, it is not a necklace made of bananas. And so some of this is like pretty funny and like, you know, inconsequential. Uh, but some of these mistakes can be not as funny. So this, it says, is a sign sitting on the grass. And clearly it's like totally missed everything that's important about this. Um, so yeah, what, what do our perceptual systems have that this very sophisticated artificial system doesn't? Um, and it's kind of an oversimplification, but I think it, it's not wrong to say that artificial systems do pretty well with sensation. They're able to take, computer systems are able to take in a lot of data to process it and use complicated math to find patterns and extract those, um, to search through huge databases very quickly. Um, and there are some aspects of perce perception that they're able to do decently. Um, but for the most part, artificial systems have difficulty with um, kind of selecting which subset of the information uh, consists is, is an object and then kind of focusing in on, on that one object. So if you were to have that mixture of speech from the cocktail party, it needs to kind of be able to to identify what belongs to one auditory object and kind of separate that out from the other uh, sounds in that case. And a great example of this is automatic speech recognition. Um, so I don't have any deep neural networks, but I have some simpler sort of examples. So as we saw earlier in the cocktail party, it's difficult to take these sound mixtures and to separate them into objects and voices. Um, and so background noise um, and other talkers are a big problem for these algorithms. As you can see in this uh, voice to text thing, it's pretty long, but basically um, somebody without even really realizing it sent this long text that seems to be a mixture of them talking and the TV and the background speakers leading to just total <laughs> utter nonsense that the other person is not able to understand at all. Um, and I bet we all have kind of similar sorts of experiences. Um, and these algorithms also have trouble with speech that's kind of muffled or kind of distorted in any way. So if you're, if you're not looking at it or if there's kind of an air conditioner in the background, these systems can't really handle that. And that's not even to mention the kind of huge amount of variation between speakers. So my voice is totally different than other people's voices. And even between different instances of the same speech sound in different contexts. So if you think of like the sound of T, so T in uh, words like cat and stop and then like hot dog, those are three very different T sounds. We don't notice it because we are speakers of this language and to us that's just the T sound, but there's actually a huge amount of variation and so it's hard to figure out how to kind of train these sorts of systems to be able to take that variability and kind of ignore it to focus on the important stuff. 
Um, and artificial sy systems kind of get tripped up by that. Um, and so that's one of the reasons that a lot of these systems have a harder time with uh, children as well as people with accents. That's kind of a huge problem. Or speech disorders or atypical voices in any sort of way. Um, and an example that I deal with almost daily is that the Google Home at my house uh, can't really handle the difference between my voice and my husband's voice. He was the one who trained it when we got it. And uh, I haven't spent the time to train it with my voice. So now I have to spend a lot of time asking him to ask Google to turn on the lights <laughs> because it doesn't seem to understand me even when I'm trying to really enunciate. All right. So in addition to kind of forming these objects and, and kind of selecting them to pay attention to them, um, artificial systems also have difficulty kind of organizing the sensory information in such a way that they can discount those irrelevant or unimportant aspects of the uh, stimulus that aren't important for the task at hand. So we've talked about this a little bit with some of the other examples, um, and this brings up kind of an important word in the uh, field of perception, which is invariance. Um, so I'll explain this with an example. Um, so if you take this photo of a cat and put it into a very sophisticated computer object recognition system, this is a graph of kind of its guesses and its confidence, and you can see it's almost 100% confident that this is a picture of guacamole. <laughs> It's unclear why, this hasn't really been doctored in any way, um, but if you then take this photo and just tilt it a little bit, now it's pretty sure that it's a cat, and not only a cat, like a tabby cat. So that change, um, which doesn't really make any difference to us, is a huge difference to a computer. And that's kind of like what we were seeing with the Abraham Lincoln stuff. The information that's coming in is, is totally changing. Um, and so obviously, the human object recognition system has no problem with these kinds of changes. So another thing that can really goof up computers, this isn't the greatest picture, but um, this photo, the dog has been kind of shifted over slightly. And the computer can handle one and not the other. It doesn't see that as a dog like it did before. Um, and the same thing is true for other subtle changes like size. I can't even tell that those are different sizes, but they are. And what they call natural motion. So here, this is a video that I have seen of an otter eating cat food, um, and its mouth is a little bit more open in one frame than the other. And to us, of course, that's like totally even hard to see, possibly. But that actually is a big difference in the image that the computer kind of can't understand. And so this idea of invariance is also important to kind of other sensory systems, including speech. And because the internet is full of these kinds of examples, um, here I just have, you know, uh, there's differences between, as I said before, different speakers, different dialects. So a lot of these systems have a lot of trouble with Southern accents, um, there's, or Scottish accents especially. Um, but again, also things like speech disorders, which can be extremely frustrating if you have some sort of problem where you maybe have to use uh, a voice activated system, but it doesn't recognize your voice, that can be a big issue. Um, but there's also other aspects of sound that we have to be invariant to, things like loudness. For most things that we're doing, the actual loudness of a sound isn't important for its identity, which is usually what we care about. And so we need to be able to kind of ignore that and focus on kind of the other features that are important. All right, and lastly, um, artificial systems have a lot of difficulty with things like physics or causality or the motion of that otter's mouth like we saw previously, because that requires some sort of knowledge about how the world works. It's not just a, a pattern that you can kind of pull out of the stimulus. Um, and that's because, of course, perception is more than just kind of picking up on patterns, even if those patterns are kind of very sophisticated. Um, and in the case of vision, um, kind of having knowledge about the world is important because a lot of the things, the aspects of the object that are most important for behavior aren't kind of obvious in uh, the information that's hitting the retina. Things like whether an object is hard or soft, whether it's heavy or light, hot or cold, edible or poisonous, these are things that we have to kind of learn um, through our experience actually interacting with them. They're not obvious just from the visual signal. Um, and computers only have like a matrix of numbers coming in. They don't have this kind of experience with objects. Um, so for example, 
you can you actually are using a lot of sort of physics knowledge by when you look at this pile of dirty dishes and decide whether it's stable if you wanted to put off doing dishes could you balance your plate on top or would you need to kind of restack things so they wouldn't fall is the food that's on the plate there is that slippery do you need to think about that so it's kind of a lot of the sort of reasoning that goes into looking at this um, and a lot of research with kind of computer object recognition systems use uh, like a tower task so it looks kind of like a Jenga tower and the computer has to decide whether it's going to tip over or not or which way it's going to tip over and these are things that we're actually very good at doing and very sensitive if I were to place my water bottle kind of like right here you would know exactly where I needed to put it for it to fall over um, but computers don't have that same sort of understanding of what a water bottle is and how gravity works <coughs> All right. So I think an example of kind of the overall difference between computer perception and human perception, um, we have kind of a really rich experience of the world. So looking at this photo, there's tons of stuff that you pretty quickly are able to figure out about it. You recognize there's a bunch of people. One of them is Barack Obama. They're in a locker room. Uh, there's a mirror here. So there's not actually two Obamas. This mirror, you know how mirrors work. Um, you can see this guy is standing on a scale, even though the scale is the same color as the stuff around it. That might be hard for a computer to pick up. You know how scales work. Um, you know that he's measuring his weight. You know that people are self-conscious about their weight. You can understand that Obama's stepping on the scale, which is going to make it read heavier, which he's going to not like, and everyone else is going to think it's funny because he doesn't know. There's a whole several levels of things that you're able to pick up when you are just looking at this sort of image. Um, so then I went ahead and took this image and put it into kind of some freely available online sort of automatic uh, computer vision systems, which admittedly are, are not the most advanced in the field because they're publicly available. Um, but this is what I got. So Microsoft Caption Bot sees this as a group of people standing in a room, which is true, but not really the whole point. Um, and then Google's Cloud Vision AI <laughs> has a guess of the objects in here, which include suit, event, white color caller, worker, gentleman, formal wear, business person, job, and tuxedo. Again, not all of those are wrong. Some of them might be wrong, but there's just a lot missing. It didn't see the scale, which is a very important part of this photo. All right, so in this section, we've taken a look at some of the ways that um, artificial computer perception systems have failed, um, namely in object formation, in becoming invariant to these kind of unimportant changes to the stimulus, and knowledge about the world, um, to kind of highlight some of the things that we are able to do that aren't very easy. Um, so yeah, we'll go into how our brain begins to solve these problems uh, after a short inter intermission. Um, but before that, questions. Any questions? Yes? Well, why aren't the most sophisticated um, AI things on like how, to, how they see the world? Why aren't they available to a lot of them actually are, um, but as computer code. Um, so I could have downloaded it, but I'm, I'm an okay computer programmer, but I wasn't expert enough to be able to figure that out for this. But if you did want to kind of run a lot of these things on your own computer, a lot of it is actually available. Some of the like, like Google's self-driving car code is probably not available, but there's a lot of stuff that you can play with. And if you're really into it, you can even take these kind of neural networks and, and mess with them, change them, retrain them all kinds of different things. So yeah, a lot of it is available, but not for a computer newbie like me. <laughs> yeah? Yes? So I'm wondering about, like, so for children who don't have that, like, learned experience, and how does that change? Like, I, I don't know how you'd even measure that. There's a lot of, like, kind of psychology research looking at how kids can understand these sorts of physics. And actually, they're really good really fast. So they're, they do looking experiments with, like, infants. Like, I think there's some, you know, less than a month old. And they show them things like there's a box and three things go into it. And then they turn it over and dump it out and two things come out. And the infants kind of, you know, they look at it longer. They're trying to figure it out. And so they clearly have, like, some of that or... There's like a video of an object and like it looks like it's rolling up a hill. Like they find that, you know, totally implausible. So they have amazingly some sorts of like intuitions probably picked up from the fact that like 
they are exploring their, their world kind of from the second or even before they're born. They can hear. Um, so they're learning about kind of the statistics of sounds. But I don't know if that, so some, some of that has to get better with age. It's not like none, like, um, uh, the conservation of, of volume. Um, I know that that changes from my like intro site class. So if you take, I think it's up until like about six years old, it, if you give kids kind of a tall, skinny container of water and like a short, fat container of water that is the same volume, even if you pour the water from one to the other and show them that it's the same amount of water, they'll always think that the, the taller one is, is bigger because um, they just can't kind of get that. So that's kind of, that feels like it might be more complex than the kinds of perception stuff I'm talking about, but I wouldn't be surprised if some things do kind of develop. Any other questions? Yeah? So, of course, there's a lot of interest in machine learning and artificial intelligence, deep neural networks, etc. Mm -hmm. um, the question that I have is, given your experience, should we be optimistic that we can solve these problems? I think yes. I don't want to be like those MIT scientists, uh, but I would think so. I mean, I'm not like directly in that field, but I work with people who are like on the cutting edge and even the stuff, like I said, that I've seen in the past few years is like way better. Um, and if you look at kind of like a self-driving car and the image that it sees as it drives, it's kind of like that example where it had like the cat and the ground and the sky. That's basically what it's doing in real time to identify different stuff. And if you look at from like two years ago to now, what they're using to test these things, it's like totally different. So I would think that probably gonna make a lot of progress. What I would be worried about is that the progress is so fast and so good that it fools us. So I don't know if you've seen these like deep fake videos Basically, you can generate videos of people and have them say certain things using deep learning that are basically indistinguishable from real videos. So you can have somebody record themselves saying whatever they want, and then they can take existing video of Barack Obama and like change it and make his mouth move and change the sound to be like his voice, and it can be very convincing. So that could be a big problem. We'll see. Yeah? Yeah. If so, then does something change? If, like when it like looks at like a place or something, does it change? Yeah, so there's a lot of research on that because that would make a huge difference if we could teach computers to understand a lot about physics. And actually one of the people who's kind of leading this whole research field is at MIT and I've like, he's, he's very smart and so I can't understand everything he's saying, but they're, they're making progress. They're kind of teaching the computer some basic principles like how gravity works and how you can look at something and tell if it's heavy by, I don't know, how much it moves in the wind or, or how quickly it falls down a slope. So they're trying to teach it these kind of basic things um, and then hoping that it'll be able to use that information in, in more complicated sorts of ways. I don't know how successful it is so far, but there's definitely a lot of people studying that because that, yeah, that would make a big difference. Yeah. Yeah? Is having um, like a machine try to learn by just giving it one like sensory experience, is that in itself kind of an ill-poised problem? Because like we learn by I see. all senses. Yeah, I would say yes. <laughs> and especially because all of those senses can help you learn about kind of the physics of the world. So like seeing something and touching it and knowing kind of how those things go together is really important. Um, I wouldn't be the best person to ask, but I don't know of any sorts of people who are trying to kind of train a network with multiple senses. But that might just be because it's hard to kind of figure out how you would input that. Like we have these really cool sensors um, and I don't know kind of if there's an, a straightforward way to kind of have those different inputs come together, but I, I don't know. Because I think, yeah, I think you're right. That's definitely a big limiting factor. Yeah, any other, yes? Um, 
You mentioned like how AI can teach us stuff about our own perception. Mm -hmm. Has it taught us anything new about our own perception? Mm. That's the question. Um, so AI can teach us about our perception, but has it taught us kind of anything new that we didn't already know? Um, I don't know for sure. I, th I would guess yes, but I think that might be more like me on a personal level, like, or you know, a person might not realize like, huh, that is a really complicated problem. But I don't know that that necessarily means that the whole field of perception didn't kind of already know that. Um, yeah. It's more like appreciation. Yeah, yeah, but I could I could be wrong. What's what I find interesting, although I'm biased as a neuroscientist. Oh gosh, is that um, we are now trying to use uh, kind of AI and computer models and look at how that kind of relates to the brain. Different like levels of processing, different brain regions to try to figure out if we design this thing and we kind of know what it's doing, can we find where those exact things are happening in the brain? So that's another kind of promising area that I don't know if yet we have kind of new insights, but if we can get it to kind of work, then we might. So there's kind of this interesting getting the computer systems to look more like biology and trying to like learn kind of both ways. But yeah, good question. All right, intermission. Okay, so now um, we're gonna move on to trying to learn a little bit about how your brain actually achieves some of these things. And obviously this is a huge kind of field of research and a lot of things we still don't know, um, but there's some kind of basics that hopefully will be enough for you to kind of understand some of the principles and apply them to illusions and other important problems. Um, so one of the kind of major hypotheses about the brain in general is that uh, it's essentially a prediction machine. So we're trying to kind of minimize the amount of surprise that we experience by recognizing patterns in kind of sensory information and making our best guess about about what's out there, but also what's gonna happen next. And that kind of simplifies the process so that you're not kind of starting over at every time period if you can kind of start to predict what's gonna happen. Um, and as we've seen in a lot of different ways, the information that we receive from our senses is kind of noisy and degraded or um, often extremely incomplete. Um, so we've adapted sort of a lot of ways to really aggressively fill in these gaps um, and to generalize from our previous experience with perception. And yeah, well, we're not always successful. Um, things like illusions, also some other sorts of experiences that you might have. Overall, we're pretty shockingly good at this, and, and this might not be something that you encounter very often. Um, so this is possible because there's actually a lot of structure out there in the world. Um, and this can get kind of philosophical or difficult to understand, but basically your brain spends its whole life kind of taking statistics about kind of the visual world and the auditory world and how how these things kind of all connect um, and unconsciously learning kind of these these patterns and statistical distributions and things like that um, so they can make better predictions in the future so um, We'll go into that just a little bit. And again, some of these patterns are pretty obvious. Uh, you can kind of explain them with sh nice little pictures, but some of them are like s big statistics, big complicated statistics that um, somehow your brain seems to be encoding. But so here's just a picture of a city street. Um, and to give you an idea of some of the kind of structure, so when your brain is kind of looking at this and trying to figure out what goes, what belongs to a certain object, there's obviously a lot of lines that you can use to kind of group things, um, things that are similar in color kind of groups together. So you can see, you know, these taxis, they kind of stand out. Um, but also, this taxi is occluded by these people, but your brain is able to very easily kind of make assumptions that it continues behind the people. It knows how the sort of physics of that works. You know that this isn't just a really small stoplight, that it's further away. All these sorts of very basic things um, that you've actually kind of learned from your experience with kind of the kind of stru structured, predictable sort of world. And a lot of these principles, though they're harder to kind of illustrate, but they're also active.
active in, in sort of sound. So if you think about similarity, so maybe in color, you could think of similarity in kind of sound quality or timbre. So why it might be easier to pick out a piccolo playing in an orchestra versus one of the violins. So they kind of blend together. Your brain kind of chunks things as an object um, based on a lot of different cues of things start and stop at the same time. That suggests they're probably caused by the same thing. If they kind of move together, that's another sort of pattern. Um, and so there's a whole list of all of these sorts of properties that our brain seems to be using um, to group things. Um, but in general, your brain is trying to kind of take this and make some assumptions to make it as, as simple as possible. So it would be kind of silly, though possible, to have a taxi with like a weird shape so that it doesn't actually have this bottom corner, but that is like very unlikely and the kind of Occam's razor like most likely explanation is usually the, the simplest. All right. Um, and yeah, we kind of saw this earlier, but just to show you again with sounds. Um, so I said things that start and stop at the same time. So a lot of these sort of speech sounds start at the same time with kind of these vertical lines. They kind of stop kind of at the same time, um, but in a kind of a more crowded scene, let's say you're in like a forest with you know, animal sounds, those can kind of start and stop at the same time and your brain can, can use that. And um, it's learned a lot of the structure and so if um, it's kind of occluded in some way, so if you are at that party and there's somebody else talking in the background, your brain can make some assumptions about like, oh, this kind of continues down like this and so I bet it's gonna keep continuing down so that even if I can't hear that, I can kind of assume where it's going um, and be able to kind of understand even if all of the information isn't directly accessible. All right, so another way that your brain um, kind of achieves all of these things is uh, again about the idea of invariance that we were talking about before. So your brain is able to kind of take in all this information but then discount the stuff that isn't as important. Um, and this is called both kind of invariance but in perception we call it perceptual constancy. And there's a lot of different sorts of constancies um, that we are able to kind of do even though they're not kind of obvious in the signal. So things like uh, per a stable perception of shape. So this door, as a door opens, it changes pretty radically in shape, but you have no trouble knowing that it's the same shape. It's not actually changing its shape. Or, you know, the color of an object. Uh, if you look outside at kind of at night in the moonlight, the snow still looks white, even though it's not really white. Like if you were to take a photo a close up of that snow and then look at it the next morning, Morning, you wouldn't say that that's white, but your brain is able to kind of discount the kind of lighting and uh, experience what's called color constancy. So if you took an apple or something and walked outside in the sunlight, the actual you know wavelengths of light that are going into your retina are different, but your brain's able to kind of do the math and and see it as the same color. Um, and this is true for kind of a lot of other things, size constancy, shape constancy, um, constancy of kind of an, an instrument or a voice over time. Um, yeah, so that's, here we go. So here is um, an example of color constancy like I was talking about. So this is kind of a, another toy example like, you know, the snow outside or an apple or something. So uh, checkerboard with A and B, some of you have probably seen illusions like this. Um, which one is lighter in color? B. B? Yeah, B looks white, and this one looks gray or black. But actually, they are the same color. So if I just connect them, they're the same color. Yeah, and you can see that as soon as I remove that sort of rectangle, it just it goes right back to how you saw it before. Like I can't make myself see them as the same color, and that's because your brain knows how lighting works. That if this one, here I'm going to go back to where we, come on, there, it knows that you know if this one is in the light and it looks like this, it must be pretty dark. Whereas if this one's in the shadow, it must actually in, in real life be lighter and it's darkened by the shadow. Um, but really, the actual kind of pixel colors are, are the same. Um, so a lot of this stuff is you know, not important to our, our task. We are seeing this as kind of a cylinder on a checkerboard, and so we can ignore and discount this kind of uh, information and become invariant to these kinds of unimportant changes. Um, all right, I'm gonna blink that a few times, great. 
all of my animations. Okay, so um, we talked a little bit about um, when we were talking about computer perception, about this kind of knowledge of how the world works and physics, um, and that we can do all of this because we have multiple senses and a whole lifetime of experience. Um, and so your brain kind of takes all this information that it's learned throughout your whole life, although also a lot of it is in place very early, um, and kind of assumes you know the world is going to continue to work the same way. Um, and actually, there's a lot of research looking at kind of our internal model of the world, so kind of the exact assumptions that we have and how we kind of change those if we encounter something that doesn't conform to our expectations about the world how we kind of incorporate that information into our kind of world model and that's a lot of kind of statistics and Bayesian things that I won't go into any of the math of that but there are a lot of people who study kind of what this world model is all right, so um, there's also a lot of fun illusions that make use of our sort of knowledge of physics. So in this video, um, this kind of depends again on our knowledge of how lighting and shadow work. So you're gonna see a basketball and it's just gonna move from the lower left corner to the upper right corner and it's gonna keep the same exact motion the whole time. But what's gonna change is the shadow and you're gonna see that depending on how the shadow changes, it's gonna look like the ball is is changing. It's not just going in a straight line anymore, but it is. Okay. All right, so it starts moving. No shadow yet. You can see it's just kind of rolling. And then I think now they're going to add a shadow. Maybe it looked like it jumped up to some of you. Maybe not. I think after this is when it gets weird. Nope, after one more. All right, so now they're gonna mess with the shadow. <coughs> and I bet you all, whether you are trying to or not, are seeing it as kind of levitating. Because yeah. you know that when a shadow is separated from something, that means that it's not on the ground or the surface or whatever. And here, the ball is not bouncing. It's just the shadow that's moving. But it's so hard to try to convince yourself. Right. So yeah, that's kind of all about your sort of knowledge of, of physics and lighting. And actually, after I had put this into this PowerPoint, I saw a tweet that did a really good job of highlighting another sort of thing. Um, so this says here, this is incredible footage of a helicopter going down way too fast. And where is, there it is. So let's look at this helicopter coming down way too fast. Oh gosh. And it's a toy. <laughs> it works better, I think, on a, a brighter screen, but I like flinch. It looks like it's going to crash. And then you realize, oh, it's teeny tiny. Um, so that's because the size of the helicopter, especially at the beginning, is, is ambiguous. But your brain has all, these, all this knowledge about you know, the average size of a helicopter, the fact that you know, it might look small because things that are far away are very small, but then it looks like it's moving fast because the actual speed and your visual field is would be consistent with something that's moving very fast if it's if it's close by um, but then it's only when the helicopter kind of passes in front of like the foreground and you can compare its size to other things and know that it's in front of those things that you realize that is actually very small um, where is there so I really like this one <laughs> Yeah, and that's kind of similar to, um, you might have heard the, the moon illusion. So I don't know if you've noticed that the moon, when it's on the horizon, it looks huge, like way bigger than when it's in the sky. But if you were to actually like take a measurement device, it's pretty much the same size. There might be a little bit of variation for like astronomy things, I don't know. But it's, it's not nearly as dramatic as it looks. It's just that you have some context to compare it to on the horizon. You know the sizes of those things. And so it makes the moon look really giant. Okay, so all of this and kind of a lot of the things we were talking about earlier when we were talking comparing human to computer perception, it's all your brain's way of taking this kind of ambiguous and incomplete sensory information using kind of all of the possibilities and shortcuts and assumptions and information that it has to make its best guess about what's out there in the world and then thus what you should perceive. Um, and again, we've only begun to scratch the surface. There's a lot of really cool work, kind of mathematical modeling, but also sort of psychology sorts of perception on how this all works. 
All right, so um, I think we've talked enough about some of the concepts that we can go back and see if we can figure out how these viral illusions from the beginning of the lecture, how they work. Um, all right, so what color is the dress? So um, we talked a little bit about kind of color constancy, but basically the way your brain determines the color of something depends on two things. It depends on the color of the object you're seeing and the color of the light source. So the color of this dress depends on you know the pigments of the fabric and how those are reflecting light, but it also depends on the light source in this photo, which is pretty ambiguous. It's a very kind of overexposed, low quality photo. Um, so is that kind of garish but warm lighting from the department store that's shining on the front of it? Or is it some kind of light, maybe natural light from a, a window or another light that's coming from behind in that upper corner? It could be either. And because we just have this one cut out image and no sort of context around it, it's hard to figure out which one is kind of the true light source. Um, but our brain needs to, needs to figure that out in order for us to assign a color to it. This is kind of a problem your brain is always solving. Um, and so it needs to figure out what color the light is and where it's coming from. So in order to subtract the illuminant, we have to know about light and daylight. So this is a great XKCD kind of comic trying to explain this. Um, but basically our brain knows a lot about how light works and because we evolved on Earth with our sunlight, we know a lot about how sunlight works. Um, and the color of, of sunlight, which is kind of the primary light that we're exposed to and what we try to like emulate in a lot of our inside lights, it changes throughout the day. It changes from orange to blue. And because that kind of color of sunlight isn't really important, it's one of the things that we're kind of invariant to that we kind of just get rid of. Um, and it doesn't tell us anything about the real color of objects. We just need to use it to find the real color. So yeah, we are invariant to the color of the illuminant. It's called discounting the illuminant. Um, but the colors of the pixels in this dress image, which is there in the middle, okay, is not the best projector, but they're actually, if you take the pixels and kind of look at them in a different context, they're actually kind of blue and orangish or brown. Um, but the brain kind of has to figure out what that ambiguous color could mean. And so it uses this knowledge about sunlight. Um, and some people who see it as, as kind of gold and white, um, or versus black and blue has to do with kind of which light you're assuming is lighting it. So people either discount the blue side of the of the spectrum um, and assume that the dress is kind of in shadow, I'm trying to get backwards, in which case they end up seeing it white and gold. So if you see the dress as being in shadow or backlit, you're gonna see it as kind of um, yellow and gold, or white and gold. Or you discount the kind of warmer light, assuming it's lit from the front, um, and in that case, you tend to end up with a blue or black perception. So, I know that's like really complicated, but you can get an idea for it with um, a much more controlled illusion. So this is like a man-made illusion um, to try to get at some of these ideas. So these kind of Rubik's Cube-like things that are in these weird rooms or whatever that have different colored light. So yellow illuminant or blue illuminant. Um, all right, so what color are, are these on the top here? Blue. I almost said what color are these blue ones. Um, and again, these other ones, yellow. Yep, and you can see they're the same ones that are yellow here. And then predictably, you can imagine that actually they're both gray. Uh, I know, I know, right? All right, so these are, these are blue, these are yellow. <coughs> but they're actually gray. <laughs> I know, it's, it's like, it's impossible to, to kind of convince your brain that that's true. Um, because your brain is just so automatically subtracting the illuminant. It sees that, oh gosh. Okay, yeah, it sees that, um, nope. Yeah, that this is lit by yellow light, and so I need to subtract out a bunch of yellow from what I'm seeing here. And this is lit by blue light, so I need to subtract out a bunch of blue that I'm seeing here. And it's in the kind of subtraction there that you're actually seeing these as blue and these as yellow. And there's a lot about kind of the biology of how your, your retinal cells work, but it's basically you're kind of subtracting out this, this information. Which is cool. And then my friend who's in my lab and actually studies color constancy and color perception um, 
she made this <laughs> version, um, which again went like semi-viral, which is the only way that I can begin to imagine that it's white and gold. Um, it's still, still hard for me to see, but if we put, put these people, so we also, in addition to knowing a lot about sunlight, we know a lot about skin, um, and so having skin in there can be helpful. Um, and you can see that here it looks like there's kind of maybe light directly on her, but here, I don't know, maybe I'm thinking too much about it, but I imagine almost that it's kind of lit from behind. It still looks like it's kind of in shadow. So yeah, this is kind of our best guess. There's also a lot of other stuff at play here. So my friend Rosa, who, who made this, she actually got two scientific papers out of this dress illusion, because um, it was like exactly what she studies, and gave people a bunch of sort of surveys. Um, and there are some things that seem to kind of maybe relate to how people perceive it. One, the one that I think is most interesting and I like hope is real, but it's kind of weak evidence, um, has to do with whether you're kind of a morning person or an evening person. So there's a slight relation that if you're a morning person, you're more likely to kind of assume that this is like morning type light. Um, whereas if you spend more time kind of in nighttime lighting, you're more likely to kind of assume that it's this bluer sort of evening illuminant. Um, that's not the whole explanation. There's probably a lot more, um, and that's not true for everybody. But yeah, this is one of these complicated things that you know people might have slightly different statistical conclusions. Um, yeah, but it all has to do with your kind of understanding of light. All right. So what about this Laurel and Yanni um, example that I won't play unless you want me to? So again, it's kind of very different, but the, the culprit, again, is kind of ambiguity. So the word itself, um, the sound, I hate to say is actually Laurel. It's from an online dictionary pronunciation guide. It's read by this voice actor slash opera singer. Um, but what makes it so ambiguous is that it was you know, recorded from laptop speakers and then probably compressed and saved in a bunch of different formats, um, and we're probably all listening to it on not very good speakers. But basically, that whole process kind of degrades the signal and makes it harder for your brain to kind of see or hear that structure that we saw earlier. So, um, so that you can maybe see this now that you're an expert at looking at spectrograms. This is the the waveform, so the like actual pattern of vibration of this word. Um, and then here is a spectrogram of that word. So again, time here, this is the frequency, and this is that guy saying the word Laurel or Yanni or whatever you're hearing. Um, and you can see there's some structure, there's this thing that's like kind of a U shape that starts high. Um, the exact details aren't important for you to know, although if you would like to know them, I would love to explain to you all about phonetics. Um, but basically, there's this one feature of the sound that starts high, higher frequency for the L sound, it dips down for the R sound, it goes back up for the L sound. And there's kind of other stuff happening down here and maybe up here. Um, but then a speech scientist named Brad Story um, went ahead and recorded recorded himself saying the words Laurel and Yanny. And you can see that they, again, have this kind of U-shaped thing, both for Laurel, but also for Yanny. And this projector is terrible. Um, but I hope you can see that there's this like U-shaped thing. And there are some subtle differences. So if you had like perfect recordings of Laurel and Yanny, obviously you could tell them apart because you can hear the differences, so your ear can kind of see the differences. But they're actually really similar in this kind of auditory acoustic space, even though they don't seem like they would be similar. Um, and so basically what's happening is your brain is having to kind of pick out a subset of all of this energy for like what is important. And this is kind of ambiguous and it's almost like a mixture between these two in certain ways. So depending on what your brain is kind of picking out and determining is important, you're gonna kind of perceive something different. Um, and I think another reason that this works is that it's totally free of context. So it's just a single word it's a kind of weird word, like even the word laurel isn't that common, but if it were in a sentence, like she sits on her laurels, you, or like, you know, something about a, a laurel being awarded to someone, you would, you would hear it that way. Or yanny isn't even a real word, but if, if it were in some sort of context, maybe it's the end of one word and the beginning of another one or something, you would have no problem telling the difference. Um, and also, we don't really know this speaker. If he were like our cousin or our best friend, maybe you would hear this and you'd have no problem with it because you know exactly the kind of quirks of this guy's voice. 
But yeah, basically you have this little fragment of information, your brain is making its best guess. Um, and if you want to know more about the exact acoustics, I can talk all about formants. All right. So yeah, our brains are basically guess making different guesses. Um, and I think what's kind of fun about at least these two illusions and a lot of other illusions that scientists kind of make is that people tend to perceive one thing or maybe it's something where you can, it kind of switches back and forth um, kind of randomly. And so our brain has kind of figured out a way, it has its strategies and it's like sticking to them. And actually they call that like sticky, like how sticky is an illusion. Um, but some illusions or perceptions on the other uh, hand are what we call cognitively penetrable. So it's something that you're able to contemplate consciously kind of change the way you're perceiving it um, to hear or see what you want. So just a few days after this whole Laurel Yanny thing exploded, um, this video, which is a very poor quality video, but kind of exploded onto the scene. And it's a little plastic toy and it says something. So I'm going to play it for you and then you guys will let me know what you hear. Oh. Uh, cancel. This is supposed to be a video. Skip. Skip. Oh, wait, nice. So, what did people hear? Both? All right, so you know the, the two things. How many people heard any other words? Bandido in Spanish. Bandido? Oh, that's a good one. I actually have never done this with a, like a native speaker of, well, Spanish. It's cool. Do you hear, I hear brainstorm, maybe. Could also be that the speakers aren't that great. But what's cool about this is, okay, so I heard brainstorm, but you can also kind of make yourself hear green needle is what people have found. So I'll let it play and see if you can go back and forth kind of trying to hear brainstorm or green needle or some combination. There's no right answer, but. Okay. Is it working? <laughs> oh man, I forgot how long this was. Are people able to kind of switch back and forth? Yeah. It's super weird. If that doesn't work, we can try it on, on different speakers. I you don't? All right, we'll have, to, we'll have to see afterwards. But yeah, it's a, another sort of example of like, this is a really low quality like plastic toy, I guess. Um, and it's like making a noise that is ambiguous. And so your brain is trying to figure it out. And I mean, maybe if this were like, I don't know, an action figure called Brainstorm or something that would like bias you to hearing that. Um, but there's any sort of number of things that your brain can come up with. Oh gosh, now I have to go back to this. Okay. All right, not oh, very useful. Okay, so I've showed you uh, some fun illusions and explained a little bit about how your perceptual system works. Um, but personally, maybe it's just because I get asked these things, I also think it's important to ask ourselves sort of why, why we care. I mean, we perceive what we perceive, that's fine. Um, but I think it's an important scientific question, obviously, because I'm a scientist, but also something that non-scientists can find interesting. Um, so I think it's just really interesting and important to kind of uh, know about ourselves and our brains and how they work. Um, we know so little about the kinds of computations that our brain is doing, kind of at a very detailed level, um, and how those computations happen bio biologically. So I haven't really talked about biology at all, um, but obviously everything is happening in kind of cells. Um, and again, these sorts of ideas can hopefully in the future help us design better computer algorithms. Um, you know, if we understand kind of how our brain is solving a lot of these sorts of problems that computers haven't been able to do very well on, uh, we can maybe design better like speech recognition that works in all types of environments with all voices. We can have self-driving cars, all these sort of great things. Um, including a lot of like facial recognition algorithms, which I think are becoming 
a, a bigger and bigger part of our society. So as we become more and more kind of surrounded by AI um, in, I don't know, self-driving cars or smart refrigerators or whatever, um, we need to be aware of the shortcomings of these systems um, so that we can minimize them and make them work better. Um, and how sort of our like biases and the fact that we are humans trying to build this perceptual system, how that can affect things. Um, and just a couple examples. So as we saw earlier, uh, object recognition can be difficult for computers. Um, and some of these things are just kind of annoying. So actually, like yesterday, I tried to post a bunch of clothes on the Buy Nothing Somerville Facebook group, so I could just give away some clothes. Um, but Facebook wouldn't let me because it thought that one of my gray dresses was illicit content. <laughs> and it's just a gray dress. Um, so I can't post it on Facebook or I have to like have it reviewed. Um, but so like that's annoying, but that's not a big problem. Sometimes these mistakes can be pretty serious. Um, so this is a computer programmer uh, named Jackie Alcine, and he found that his Google Photos app um, kept tagging pictures of him and his girlfriend as gorillas, which is inc incredibly insulting. Um, and Google, of course, he, he contacted them, tweeted at them, and they said that they were a Called, they apologized, said they would fix it. Um, and this is likely, for some reasons we can talk about later, uh, caused by the sorts of data that Google used to train this algorithm. Um, but instead of kind of completely overhauling their system, the way that Google later reports have shown, the way that they fixed this is they just took the word gorilla out of the computer's vocabulary. Um, so now it can't classify gorillas. It can classify other types of monkeys. Um, but this is kind of like a Band-Aid on, on this problem. And uh, these short-term solutions aren't going to work if we want to make like serious progress in the future if we can't have stuff like this happening. Um, and another example that I uh, have heard more and more about is Amazon's facial recognition algorithm called Recognition, with a K, um, which caused a big outcry um, after an ACLU report um, used that system and uh, basically took a bunch of photos and ran it through the system and saw whether or not it matched um, these photos of people to a mugshot database, um, including they gave it all of the members of, of Congress. <laughs> and found that uh, several of them, 28 of them, were matched to a mugshot database, which in this example isn't necessarily bad and, I don't know, maybe not even like, it's kind of funny, but you can imagine that if this is something that like is used in an airport to decide if you're going to get screened or for some other sort of important thing, this could be a big problem if the computers think that you're a criminal. Um, and so yeah, they used, they compared every member of Congress to 25,000 public arrest photos and found these matches. And what's also troubling is that this was disproportionately true for people of color in Congress. So 20% of Congress is people of color, but of these matches, this is about 40%. Um, and there are all kinds of other terrible statistics about this. And what's especially kind of unnerving is that this exact algorithm recognition is being used for unspecified purposes uh, by the FBI and ICE. So it can have some really big effects for people. Um, yeah. And we should know about that and be concerned, and computer scientists should be trying to fix it. Um, so yeah, clearly these algorithms need some work. We have some way to go. Um, and hopefully learning about kind of our biological system can help us there. Um, but some other sorts of benefits that I think all of us, even if we aren't computer scientists, can appreciate is that you know, our perception is how we relate to the world and, and everyone around us, and how we kind of understand and internalize and make sense of things that are happening, and can have a big impact on our emotions and attitudes. And a lot of times when we talk about perception kind of in a non-science sort of situation, we mean something that's pretty different from what I've been talking about today, something kind of more philosophical. Um, but I think there's kind of a, a parallel that you can draw between these different definitions of perception um, in that kind of what we see or feel isn't necessarily like true. There's kind of a lot of complexity there. Our perception isn't necessarily kind of an accurate depiction of reality. Um, and that can be a really useful thing to keep in mind. And it's actually uh, the basis of cognitive behavioral therapy, which is a really uh, useful sort of mental health 
treatment that basically involves um, identifying the sorts of damaging or unhelpful automatic thoughts or perceptions that you're having and then challenging and trying to to consciously correct them so that's one way that our kind of perceptions can be hurting us and then we can try to actually change them and of course um, just kind of more generally there's a huge variety of different sensory experiences in the population things like sensory processing disorder or people with autism um, as well as sensory impairments like uh, vision loss or blindness and hearing loss um, and also less common types of uh, impairments like anosmia which is loss of smell um, and there's also all these sorts of extreme disorders of perception so face blindness or prosopagnosia where someone has normal vision but can't recognize faces or spatial neglect which is usually after a stroke when someone doesn't see or hear or kind of care about anything on one side of their kind of visual field um, or you know schizophrenia or other sorts of hallucinations these are all very closely related to perception um, and that kind of understanding you know not only the biology behind these things but just being able to appreciate that there's this whole range of sort of sensory experiences and perceptual experiences that people um, are having and that kind of to a certain extent we're all interacting with the world in in slightly different ways all right, so to wrap up, I hope I've convinced you that we are kind of blissfully unaware of how complex perception actually is and that it's kind of an active process rather than just purely a passive one and that our brain is kind of constructing rather than just kind of recording reality. And in order to be successful, our perceptual system needs to use different strategies and assumptions to fill in a lot of the gaps in the incomplete information that it's getting from our senses and that we can gain some insight and some amusement into the ways our brain does this by understanding kind of the mistakes our brain is making and illusions. So uh, next time an illusion goes viral on the internet, if that happens again, um, I hope you'll be better equipped to kind of understand some of the principles that are at play um, and how that tells us about what we experience in the world. All right, so thank you very much for coming. Thanks to our funding sources. The end. <laughs> All right. Questions about the last section? I'll also stick around afterwards. Yeah? I have a question about colorblindness. So I'm always yes. What, usually we develop traits kind of through evolution because they're beneficial to us. Why does such a large group of people, why did they evolve to not perceive colors in the same way as another yeah. group of people? So colorblindness almost always is caused by like problems with the cells in the retina that um, perceive colors. So we have three different types of them that are kind of sensitive to different wavelengths or different colors. And if we have three, for physics reasons, we can kind of triangulate and use those to identify a bunch of colors. And so color blindness is caused by someone missing one of those three uh, kind of color sensors. And that like greatly limits the colors that you can see. So it's, pretty, it's like a biological genetic thing. Um, and as for why it exists, because it doesn't seem adaptive, my guess is that it exists for humans because we're able to like transcend this. We don't have to go foraging for berries all the time. There's actually some research, I forget all the important details, but some species of monkey that lives on some island and has to forage for fruit, and a weirdly large percentage of them have monkey color blindness and they actually don't live as long um, or the other monkeys have to feed them they'll starve to death because they won't be able to find as many brightly colored fruits because they can't distinguish the fruits from the trees so my guess is way back when they probably didn't live as long and but now we're kind of able to for genetics reasons that this is kind of coming back again yeah Questions? Yeah? Um, can you just explain um, what you meant by uh, our brain like aggressively fills in those blanks? Like I'm a little confused. Yeah. Um, basic, we're the brain is kind of always trying to, to fill in the gaps. And so I just meant that it's something that is kind of happening a lot and it's happening like kind of very strongly. And even if we want to kind of override it, like some of those color demonstrations or the shadows, like your brain is just like, no, this is the way it is. So that's, 
just my example. But yeah, basically that there's all these kinds of gaps and, and I can show you some like really other cool examples, some of which are like literal gaps in sound that your brain kind of fills in. Um, but gaps in kind of all sorts of different information that your brain is kind of filling in or explaining away um, just constantly. Is that why the robot like, or the AI or whatever they think sort of like it's something different? Yeah, so there's a lot of reasons that stuff like that is happening. I actually don't know a lot about how like computer vision or audition would do it kind of filling in these gaps. Um, mostly because a lot of times people don't don't show their their systems these sorts of illusions but actually um, so that example way back at the beginning the sound of the two like things tone streams crossing that actually is work from one of my lab mates who is kind of developing her own sort of like computer hearing system, but she's programming in a bunch of statistics to try to make it behave more like humans. And so a lot of those illusions, like if she plays that exact crossing tone stream thing to this model, it will produce a bunch of guesses, but they'll be kind of what we are guessing, where like most of them are kind of these bouncing things. So it uses a lot of the same sorts of strategies that we're using. But I don't know if there if there's a lot of stuff known about how other systems kind of fill in the gaps. Yeah? Yes? Is perception in humans, is, is it hierarchical in that like you will recognize one aspect of, let's say, a picture first, like the color, and then comes object recognition, and then comes meaning afterwards? That is not really known and something that a lot of people are currently working on. So like, I don't know, in, in my lab, there's a girl who's trying to understand um, face recognition and whether we know about the identity of a face at the same time that we know about other things like its gender, age, familiarity, all these other things that we kind of extract from a face, like do those all happen at once? Do they happen in some sort of sequence? Um, and there's that kind of research for like every aspect of everything. We don't really know. Um, and there's, until pretty recently, there haven't been very good methods to look at that with like fine enough temporal resolution. Um, yeah, we don't, we don't really know. The time scale, the I would say 150 milliseconds and less. Between, so for vision, kind of the fast, like it takes 50 to 60 milliseconds for the information to kind of get from your, from your eye up to your brain. So between kind of 70 and 150 is like visual perception. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes? Are you working on anything um, that's going to help like with those disorders or like blindness or anything? I feel bad because the answer is not really. <laughs> At least not right now. Um, I'm doing kind of slightly different stuff, trying to understand the different pathways within the auditory system. So kind of like, do we know all of these different things at once? That you can also ask like, what sorts of features or properties are kind of processed at the same time and what are processed separately? So I'm kind of trying to study how the brain is like chopping up the sounds. But yeah, maybe someday down the road, someone else can take that information and do something useful with it. <laughs> all right, well, thank you very much for coming out tonight.